Welcome back to another episode of the Money Multiplier Podcast or the Cash Compound Podcast, wherever you're listening to us. Again, I am Jonah Dew, one of the banking bros, a money mentor with the team here. And of course, just like last episode, we've got a very special guest, uh, my colleague and partner in crime here, Hannah Kessler. Hey, Jonah. What's going on today? How are you feeling? Not much. I'm feeling pretty good here this uh, afternoon. I am uh, excited to uh, do a new topic with you and uh, try to help the folks that are listening to us or that are clients of ours who stumble upon this podcast or even the average person who has not heard an episode yet uh, kind of understand uh, infinite banking, the infinite banking concept and why we believe and, and love it so much. So I'm excited to do it. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm good. I'm good. So the sun is shining. I'm feeling good today. And uh, no, that's absolutely right. So what we do and what we teach over here is the infinite banking concept. And uh, if you want to learn more about this, we'll dive in some topics as the as weeks progress. But if you do want to really understand the foundation knowledge of what this infinite banking concept is, you can go online, go look up the banking bros on YouTube, or you can find our presentation. It's on themoneymultiplier.com. And on the homepage, if you click on the resources tab, you'll find that presentation. That's right. That's our full length feature presentation. It is about an hour over an hour long. That is how you can get the entire picture of the infinite banking concept if you are the first timer. Uh, so let's uh, jump into our episode. So just in case you're not aware, again, my name is Jonah Dew. I'm one of the banking bros. I'm an agent um, with the Money Multiplier Agency. And so that means you might find me uh, front facing or talking about infinite banking on the social media platforms or in person in a town near you. I think our next event that you might see me at is actually in Greenville, South Carolina. Uh, and on top of those responsibilities, I also head up our mapping team our tools creation team. And that team is specific to after a person, you, for instance, get started with your infinite banking policy. Uh, This team, our team will help you actually implement your policy to your everyday life. So we have helped hundreds, thousands of people uh, pay off debt or uh, do investments or rental properties or Um, you know, whatever it might be, whatever your, you know, save retirement, whatever it is, whatever your financial goal is, we can use your policy to help you accomplish it. And that's what our team uh, at the Money Multiplier will take care of. So that's, that's another responsibility that I head up. And of course, with me, we've got Hannah Kessler. I think she's going to go through uh, exactly what she does for you all and on a daily basis. So you can understand better about who she is. Yes. So yeah, no, my name's Hannah Kessler. Uh, Most of y'all know me because uh, Brent Kessler. So that's my pops. That's my dad. And uh, really, he he is the gentleman that really brought this concept to my family. And, you know, it's to completely change our family's financial life. So uh, I always say I've been around this stuff since I've been pooping in my diapers. (laughs) 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 So so but what I do, what I do for y'all is I am out here. I am educating. So um, actually, Uh, tomorrow we're heading out to Denver, Colorado. There's uh, some events going on in Denver. And then also on uh, Saturday, we'll be out in Houston, uh, Texas. So we go travel around. We we teach on this concept. Go, go, go out and speak to uh, real estate uh, uh, groups or uh, physicians, doctors, you know, whoever just needs to and and hear this information. And in my honest opinion, I think anybody who fogs up a mirror right before they get in front of it, they need to have this powerful information. So I'm out... I'm out coaching and educating and also um, heading up and managing our application team. Because when you do come to us and you want this policy, uh, we got to go through the approval process. So I I do that for the office. Very cool. I appreciate that. Walking us through exactly who we are and how we can help. So, Hannah, let's jump into our episode topic for today, if that's okay. So the episode topic, it's actually a um, a joint effort here kind of coming up with the ideas, but this particular topic was actually something that Hannah was a little passionate about that we wanted to to, uh, teach you guys. So Hannah, go ahead and let them know what the topic is. Yep. So when I'm going out and I'm 
coaching and teaching, uh, 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 what we go out and teach on is why do I like to keep my wealth stored with inside of my privatized banks, i.e. my policy, my whole life policy designed for this infinite banking concept? Why do I want to keep my wealth stored within the policy and not the conventional bank? So I don't know. I'm going to go ahead and take my two cents on this because I love this question. Okay, so, I like it too. <laughs> so so with, why I like to keep my dollar stored within the policy, my bank. Number one, this whole concept is about control. I am the one that's now in total control of that money. And then on top of that is certainty. Certainty. Certainty that when I go back to that, to my bank, I know the cash is going to be there. So let me elaborate on that. I'm, I'm, not, I'm just going to scratch the surface of this because there's so much more that we could dive into. But why I like the policies and storing my, my wealth with a mutual insurance company is, is because they practice off of a principle called Austrian economics, where what that means is, is that every $1 that they have on hand back in their reserves they cannot lend out more than that $1. So let's go to the opposite side. Let's talk about conventional banks and how we've always been taught to, to keep our money and store the wealth. Well, at a conventional bank, they operate on fractional reserve banking. So what that means is, is that every $1 that the depositors leave there with them, the bank now can lend up up to eight, nine, ten dollars per per that one dollar that's back in the reserves. So basically, they're kind of playing this gamble. Well, we hope and and we think that not everybody's going to come and do a run on the banks at the same point in time. But go back and look through history. Go back to other countries. It, it was either in Switzerland or Sweden where folks would. Th th there was a bad economic time, and folks went and did a run on the banks. However, the banks, they didn't have all of their money back there in the reserves because what were they doing? They were lending out their money and they were lending out more than what they had on hand. So what, what they did to the people is they paid out all of those smaller accounts, right? The 5,000, the 10,000, the 15,000 here, but they they did not pay back fully those larger accounts. What if you had $250,000 sitting inside of your bank account? You go to the bank. The banker says, hey, man, we can't give you the two fifty dollars because it's not back here. And instead, yeah, we'll give you maybe a, a few dollars in cash. But instead, let, let us give you some CDs, some certificate of deposits honoring and showing you that, yes, we have your money and we're going to pay you back soon. But how great great is that when you need that money to go buy groceries or to go put fuel into your car? You can't trade IOUs or these CDs for groceries, right? So how good is that? So so, so that, that's the big one of, of why I like to. And, and then just uh, two other smaller things, you know, leverage. You know, I, I like to be able to leverage the policy and still be able to always earn a compounding guaranteed interest. I like that. That that's awesome. I, I gotta I gotta ask you to go back really quick because I think we need to touch on why the average or everyday person why we are taught to even leave our money in conventional banks. In my opinion, there's not very many benefits to storing my wealth in a conventional or traditional bank, right? Uh, again, I think we've all been taught that whether it's uh, HR at work, whether it's your family, your friends, your colleagues. Uh, whether it's things you hear on the internet or see on the radio, everyone pretty much standard leaves their money in regular conventional banks. Hannah, why do you think that is? I, I mean, are, are there are there benefits that I don't know about? Am I just using the wrong banks? Like, to, to, to <laughs> my knowledge, nothing's taught. going on. Uh huh. It's just what we've been taught. It's just what we, we've been taught. It's the conventional wisdom of, of what our parents are doing, our grandparents, our friends, colleagues, coworkers. We've always just been taught, hey, if you need money and if you want to go and store that money, you either got two options. You can put it underneath your mattress or you can store it over here with me and earn less than a 1% growth. 
Right. Now I, now, I agree that putting your money in a conventional, traditional bank is very good for convenience sake. Sometimes when I get on the line with folks, I let them know that it is almost impossible to shop on Amazon without a debit card. It's just not happening, right? So mm -hmm. you do need the conventional bank for the card purposes, but having a conventional bank for the card purposes and storing your wealth, putting the lump sum of your money, the everything in the bank are very two different Two very different things. Now, Hannah, you said something else that I think we've got to touch on for just a second here. You mentioned, and I think most people know, that when you deposit money into a regular conventional everyday bank, they now have the ability to loan out more dollars than you left there. You leave them one dollar, they can loan out eight, nine, or ten. I think is exactly what you said. If you have, mm -hmm. if you did not know that for certain, just go ahead and look that up. Uh, again, that is called the fractional reserve banking system. There, mm -hmm. You leave a dollar, they can loan out more dollars than they have on hand, meaning they're making it up, right? Numbers on the computer screen, but they don't actually have the money in the coffers back at the home office. They don't have it. Now, you mentioned something else that I think people uh, don't know. I think we need to touch on for a second. Insurance companies, this is mutual insurance companies, um, have do not practice fractional banking. They actually practice something called Austrian economics, which means that for every dollar that they promise to someone, they have that dollar in the coffers, in the reserves, back at home. That's a huge deal. Mm -hmm. That is an absolute huge deal. It's not any speculation. So I've said this to some, some folks beforehand. I want to ask you this question. Have you ever heard of an insurance company, a mutual company? Have you ever heard of this company? Someone passes away. And then they don't give the spouse the death benefit. No, I haven't. No, that, that would be primetime news, would it not? That would be Absolutely. all over everything. You know, my spouse passed away. We had the policy and they won't pay. Right. That would because, be that would be nuts. It's never happened. And go ahead. No, no, I'm sorry. I did no, that, that's absolutely it because insurance companies, they have to keep up their contractual obligation. They are not in the lending business, right? They're not in the lending business of what banks are. They have to, at the end of the day, make that promise that they're going to pay that death benefit once that person passes, dies, graduates. That's absolutely right. So, so when I think about financial stability of an institution, Right. Just based on the comments that we've made so far, when I think about banks, everyone would agree. If you just ask someone how much money is the regular everyday bank making, whatever bank they could name out, we probably all agree that that bank's got millions or billions of dollars. All we, we would agree when we think of insurance companies, we don't generally associate them with being as big as banks. Right. But let me mm -hmm. ask you a question. Would you rather do business with an institution that has all the money they promise out? They have it. They have to by definition, right? By yes. by law, by principle. Or would you rather do business with an institution that's like, oh, we might, we might not, we might be over leveraged. We might just be handing it out more than we've got. Which one would you rather keep your wealth, right? Which one, which institution would you rather have your wealth in? For me, it's like a no brainer. Well, like, yep. I want the institution that actually has the money <laughs> if something happens, right? And to go back to your question of why people aren't doing this, it is because people aren't out there teaching it like how we're having this open conversation right now. You right. know, it's just it's the lack of the literacy and the knowledge out there. That's exactly correct. Another thing you had mentioned, which I like a lot, is control. You mentioned control is like your first main point. Let's talk about that for a second. What do you mean exactly by control? I guess what I'm asking is give me the control or lack of with a bank and give me how you've got control using an infinite banking policy. Absolutely. So, so number one is control. So we've all been taught that, you know, Hey, I'll go work for my money. Then when that money comes in, I'm going to go store it in my bank account. And then inside of that bank account, uh, let, let, let's make believe that, you know, we are in the market and, you know, when, when we need money or want money, we go down to the banks because that's where they keep the money, right? Willie Sutton's Law and, and, and Becoming Your Own Banker are Nelson Nash. Go read that book, a little tidbit for y'all. But, uh, but, but they keep the money right in the bank. And then the banks, they'll lend it back out to you or to somebody else for maybe a house or a car purchase or, or a home remodel, whatever you're doing. And what has to happen is, is that if the banks, the banks are the ones that are lending you the money, what needs to happen? 
you got to pay the banks back and you got to pay them back with interest and you don't skip a beat in doing it because if you don't pay them back, they're going to come and foreclose on you or come repo that car right off your lot. So when I'm using my banking policies, this is me acting as the banker in my life. So when I want to go buy a piece of property or I want to go buy the car, I will lend out from my policy to myself. And what I'm doing is I'm borrowing from the insurance company's general funds. So um, I, I don't know if we want to get into that, Jonah. Yeah, I, I won't get into that thought. But 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 what I'm doing is I'm I'm borrowing from the insurance company's funds, which allows me to leverage the cash value within my policy. I lend it to myself to go buy the property or the car. Now, what has to happen is, is that, you know, me being my own banker, I want to pay myself back. I want to pay myself back with interest because that's just the honest banker game that I want to play. Don't steal from your banking system. But here's the catch. I'm in debt to myself. I'm not in debt to a third party creditor. So me being in debt to myself, it doesn't matter if I do pay it back or even if I even pay it back with interest. Because at the end of the day, when I'm borrowing my dollars from my policy, I'm borrowing from the general funds of the insurance company. However, this is an insurance contract. I'm guaranteed to die. I like the word graduate, but I'm guaranteed to graduate. And so at my graduation date, my beneficiaries get that death benefit. So what does the insurance company do? The insurance company doesn't care what I use the money for, how I'm going to pay it back, when I'm going to pay it back, because a loan on the policy is nothing more than a prepayment of the death benefit. So at the time of my passing, if I don't pay any of my loans back and I went and bought all of these properties, these cash flowing assets throughout my life, they will just deduct the, the, the cash that I borrowed while I was living from the death benefit. And then now that death benefit is what gets paid out to my family, my children, my heirs. So, so what I mean by control is, is that I'm in control. I can decide how I want to use the money, how I want to pay it back, when I want to pay it back, instead of having the Fed, the government, and, and the central banks dictate my life. Actually, I'm happy I said the government, because let's talk about that too. The podcast topic for another time, Jonah, but all the cash inside of my policy is tax free. The government's completely out of my hair when I'm borrowing dollars from the policy. That's right. I, man, you hit it right on the head. The second thing you had mentioned was certainty. I actually wanted to read an email uh, that I just got. I won't say the gentleman's name who sent it, won't give you any personalized information, but I want to read this email that I just got yesterday when it comes to certainty, okay? A little bit of a scenario here for you. The, the person says he's got a business line of credit that's over $200,000, and he's got cash value and two infinite banking policies that total about $150,000. What he needs to do is he has some investment properties. He says he needs to stabilize this year, and it'll cost him about $150,000 to do so. So again, he's got the money in his business line of credit. He also has the money in his uh, infinite banking concept policies. Now, from this episode, you can probably understand that we would encourage him to use the money from the banking policies, right? Mm -hmm. But here's this gentleman's question as we talk about why keep your wealth stored in a policy rather than a conventional bank when we talk about the topic of certainty. He says... My consideration on which one I should use is whether or not the bank's going to freeze my business line of credit due to the impending recession announcement. Now, I'm not over here saying that the recession is coming and it's coming tomorrow. I, that's not what the topic's about. This gentleman happens to think that is happening, which is okay. You are entitled to your opinion, whether you think positively or negatively about that. But what's his question asking? He's, he's saying, I have no certainty with the money that's in the bank, with the money that's attached to the business line of credit. He Again, he goes on to say, I know I can use my policy. He says, should I use my line of credit, then use my policy as a reserve? Should I use my policy, but then use my line of credit to pay it off? Should I use my policy and don't worry about the line of credit just in case they 
case they change the, the numbers, the interest rate, they freeze it. What should I do? Right. And so mm-hmm. that type of conversation is just non-existent if we get your wealth entirely inside the policy. So the difference, right, and what we're coaching this gentleman to do is that $250,000 of a business line of credit, while that's awesome and have access to it, understand that you're not in control there. You don't have certainty there, right? You may or may not have leverage there because they can change the rules on you and turn it off. And that's just not what's happening inside your own privately owned privatized infinite banking policy. I kid you not, that email just came yesterday. Someone asking those questions, just just help really. You know, at the bottom of the email, it says, just give me some, give me your two cents, help me out because I just don't know. And again, that just goes back to when your wealth's not stored inside something that you control, you don't have that certainty or leverage, guaranteed leverage. You just don't have it. So um, I just wanted to read that. I thought that was uh, a a well-timed email that I just received just for this podcast topic here this uh, this morning. Actually, that was awesome. That that was very good, Jonah. Very cool. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us. If you are just now tuning in to the podcast, thank you guys for listening. We uh, are going to be, like we mentioned earlier, uh, all around the country. So I think Denver, Colorado is coming up for the Kessler family and also uh, some of our other agents, Chris Noggle and uh, Devin Berth, people like that. I know that Greenville, South Carolina is coming up for uh, the Banking Bros. That's myself and my brother, Jeremiah Du included. We got lots of events going on. But just like Hannah mentioned earlier, if you have not seen our full length presentation, you can do so by going to themoneymultiplier.com, scrolling all the way down to the uh, resources tab, clicking on resources. I think the presentation will be listed right there front and center for you. Um, We've also got lots and lots of videos on YouTube, the Banking Bros channel. Go, Go ahead and watch them. Reach out to us with any questions, concerns. We'd be more than happy to chat with you. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. We look forward to talking with you next time. And we'll see you then. See you then.